Welcome everyone for this special Sunday webinar where we're exploring Hindu temples and traditions. Our special guest is Dr. Knix Knix Warren. Uh, he's been working with HUA on a lot of things, teaching courses in music, uh, produced a lot of wonderful videos that we've shared, getting into yoga and the rivers of India. But today, we know that the global Hindu diaspora brings with it a slice of India's temple culture through the myriad of temples raised in cities and communities all over the world. Uh, they're beautiful, you've seen them, we shared a few of them, and we're gonna get into a lot more of that today. And temples have been an integral part of Hindu culture. And, you know, there's so much that we're gonna get into. Thousands of temples dot the Indian landscape, some as old, you know, over thousands of years old. And so in this webinar, we're going to introduce uh, our a course that Dr. Konixji is going to be teaching on Hindu temples and traditions, but we're going to go through a special presentation that uh, Konixji has presented and prepared just for us today. So Konixji, it's, uh, it's amazing and a pleasure to have you. Let me just give you now a brief introduction. Uh, so Dr. Konix, Konix Warren is an internationally known musician, composer, music educator, and scholar with several recordings, large-scale musical productions, and scores to his credit. Konixji is known primarily for his pioneering work in Indian American uh, choral and orchestral music based on ragas, but I think you are taking it to a new level with this new phase in your career. And without giving you too much more, it's just an honor and a privilege to have you here. You bring so much experience and a very intersectional and art, I mean, a beautiful perspective that we need and, and really does represent uh, the Hindu uh, Dharma. And so let me just hand it to you, Kanikshi, and we can get started. You're, you're still muted. So thank you so much um, for the very kind introduction, Akur. And uh, it's always good to see you. I admire your energy con uh, running webinar after ve webinar, uh, hosting guests and maintaining the same level of cheer and everything. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, namaste to everyone. It's I uh, really looking forward. To, I'm really looking forward to uh, um, sharing this uh, knowledge base with you. See, what um, will a course on Hindu temples offer people? See, first of all, um, um, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to take a look at my website. It's called templenet.com. And we'll share a link with all of you before the end of this presentation, where I've researched and pre presented information from more than a thousand temples from all over India. So it's like uh, the study of uh, temples requires us to put on our literally a Renaissance hats because it's a very interdisciplinary domain. It is not just about religion or it's not just about um, a form of worship alone. It's, it's, there's much more to temple worship than you can imagine. And we're just going to get a glimpse of that in this presentation today, but we will be covering a lot of it as much as possible um, during this one quarter course. But I have a feeling that we may have to expand it into multiple quarters as uh, time, time goes along. Um, so let me figure out a way to share my keynote presentation with all of you. Um, I'll share some videos and audios and all that. And I'm going to ask a lot of questions and I'm going to ask, request all of you to be ready just to type in your responses. And I'm going to request uh, Ankur to look at the responses and just shout out one or two of them. Um, most of the questions are going to be in the beginning. So let's start uh, right now. Um, so give me just one second. Yes, we love it when it is interactive. And if you want to get started and drop uh, where you are zooming in from, get yeah. the chat going, and then we'll take these uh, questions. Okay, you can see my presentation now, right? Yes. Okay, now you're gonna get into full screen mode. And I'm gonna put it in play mode so that, uh, okay. Why do I start with this slide? <laughs> um, and actually it's very relevant to somebody, somebody's question that was posted, posted in the chat window. So when you think of Egypt, you think of the land of pyramids, um, but it's very rare that, that, that India is referred to as the land of temples. Just Pause for a moment and take a look at the slide. 
look at the sheer diversity in the num- in the kind of temples that you see there and uh, it's my contention that when you refer to india you should refer to it as a land of temples and you will see at the end of this in this presentation why so uh, um, so here's a guessing game i'm just going to uh, show a few slides and i'd like people to tell me what these uh, what these temples are so n- not more than 10 15 seconds please type in your responses so just asking um Minakshi, Kum, Kumbakonam, Madurai. Uh, are people guessing it's a water reservoir? So, people, uh, are, <laughs> people are guessing. This is the Chidambaram temple, the, the world famous Nataraja temple at Chidambaram. Next. This, uh, some people should know if you are native to the area. Livermore, California. Yes, yes, yes. our audience is uh-huh. on it. Uh, yeah. Next. Looks like a Swaminarayan Mandir, uh, BAPS Mandir. Yes, Mandir, it right? is. Yes, it but is. But where is it? Yes. Is that the one in Toronto, Houston? No, it's in Atlanta. That's the one in Atlanta. Yeah. Similar architecture. Yes. These are the easier ones. <laughs> I'm sure people guess us... Malibu on this one. Yes, it is. It is. This. Maybe a little harder. But... Is it inside India or is it outside India? That I can guess. Just looking at it. It's outside of India. And uh, where do you think it is? No responses. It's in London, UK, not London, Canada. So, okay. This, many people should know. So look at the Golden Tower. This is uh, Tirupati, one of the most visited temples in India. Okay, this. Uh, just a hint, this had a major festival about a month back. Is it uh, two of our guests, uh, guest Kashi, Banaras? No, uh, no, Banasi. it's not Kashi, no. Appreciate everyone taking guesses. Let's yeah, it, that, that's really nice. So people are actually getting involved. So that's nice. So this is not a Jain. The, the, I'll give you a hint. It was the Asha Ekadashi last month. Haridwar? No, it is Pandarpur in Maharashtra. Okay, this. This is very relevant to uh, 20th century India. Just look at the architecture, you will see which part of India it comes from. I'll give you a hint, Swami Vivekananda. Uh, Kolkata. Uh, Dakshineshwar. Dakshineshwar. Yeah, which is near. Vishwaji, yeah. Yeah, A lot of people were guessing Goa. No, but um, there's this reasons why, they, why they're guessing that. But uh, yeah, and this, most people should know. Badri Kedarnath. This is Kedarnath, yes. Yes, yes, nice. Um, Madurai, Hampi. No, actually, this is Madras, Chennai. This is the landmark, one of the landmarks in Chennai. It's called the Kapali Shura Temple. This is about uh, 1300 years old, but it's in the heart of the city. city. Um, and this. Uh, the reason I'm sharing this, uh, such, a, such, such a range of pictures is that this, you can very clearly see that there's a diversity just in the way the temples look. Right, mm-hmm. so that's where we want to start. I'll uh, give the answer right away. This is Kajuraho in Madhya Pradesh, in central India. Um, and the next one, this one uh, is from Gujarat. It's a place called Modhera. It's a sun temple, and it's um, 
in a ruined state, but even then, it's even in a ruined state, it's spectacular. You got to go there to believe it. And there's a step well outside it. Uh, this most pe many people should know. It's again a sun temple in the state of Orissa. Orissa. So it's called. Uh, it, it's it's a place called Konarak, and uh, you can very clearly see there, right? The uh, the wheels. Just look at the scale of the whole thing. There are people standing in front of the wheel, and they can hardly come to the to the uh, what do you call the uh, axle? Spoke. The, yeah, the axle of the wheel. So the size of each spoke is probably about the height of a human being. So that's look at the scale of the temples. So that's the scale in which it is built. Okay, this is um, if the picture was better than this, you would just be taken aback by this temple. It's a place called Belur in uh, Karnataka, and it's uh, so intricately carved throughout. Um, it's, and this one. Sri Ayer should guess. I hope he types an answer. He was there recently, I think. It's uh, Hawaii. It's the Iraivan Temple in Hawaii, in uh, Kauai. Yeah. Okay. So that's enough of the guessing game. So the next thing is, uh, I just want to contrast to uh, uh, build a contrast to get an idea of what a temple is. So let's start with what other with places of worship in general. So we're living in the United States, when you think of a place of worship, first thing that comes to your mind is a church. But what is a church? Um, can I quickly have one or two responses typed in that can be read out very quickly? What is a church? Love the audience participation, house of God, community center. Okay, good. So this is a definition that I picked up from um, what, a blog on the internet. Internet. The church consists of God's people. It's the assembly of believers. You can see the definition. It's the assembly of believers. It's more about the people. It's more about the community rather than the physical place because the physical buildings only facilitate the fellowship, the worship, <coughs> and, the, and the ministry and all that, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So the study of churches is called, uh, um, so you can go to the, website and take a look. The, I'm, I'm just presenting this to um, get us into the idea of places of worship. Similarly, for uh, um, the uh, mosques are defined in the following manner as uh, <coughs> places where people gather for prayer and so on and so forth. Uh, so here's a question. What's a Hindu temple? Uh, rather than uh, have you type answers, I'm just going to say, I'm not putting this down because that's what we are going to be studying about in detail in the course. But I'm going to say that uh, Hindu temple is more than um, a temple is an English word. See, we really, it's not very appropriate to use English words in the um, Sanskritic context for the most part. Um, but we still continue to use the word temple in the context of a place of worship, a place where, um, but it's, we all know that it's more than a place of worship. It's not a place where people congregate to listen to messages, although that could also happen in a katha kalak shapam or something like that. But it's a place where the, um, we connect with the divine, we connect with the source of existence in some way, shape or form through an altar of worship where a deity is consecrated and held in worship through established protocols by uh, a community of uh, priests, uh, that follow certain established protocols in uh, carrying out worship out there. So, I mean, that's a very general um, definition, but we'll see more of what I'm uh, saying here um, as we move through this. So, as Puji Swami Dhananda Saraswati used to say, a temple is a place where um, the word devalaya is a word for temple, and alaya refers to an abode or a place. Then, Tamil, we use the word called kovil. Ko il, the abode of God. So Devale refers to the abode of God. But the thing is, we, in the Hindu tradition, we know that uh, all of existence is nothing other than Ish Ishwara, right? Isha Vasya Midam Sarvam. Um, then what do we mean by just having an exclusive place of worship? So it is a place where we connect to our source of existence. Um, 
Um, and uh, let, so let's look at, at some, some examples as we go further. Uh, the next slide I'm sharing is, uh, how did I get in, interested in temples? So this is a temple which is right across the street from where I grew up in the heart of Madras, um, in the heart of Chennai. Um, it's called, it's old Madras. It's called Georgetown of Paris Corner. So this was built during the British era in the year 1728, I believe, um, by a merchant who used to trade with the East India Company and he lived in Kanchipuram and he had to travel back and forth. So rather than traveling so much, he decided to spend it. He decided to spend his money and raise the temple in Chennai where he lived. And this is a pretty well endowed temple with a whole bunch of festivals and all that. And just to get an idea of what it looks like, see, this is the, um, there's so much of lung space here. This is the temple tank in the back. And this is what it looks like um, inside. And this is where I literally grew up. We used to be able to look at this temple from the second floor of my house. And we used to watch, watch, us, watch us, what is going on in there, the festivals, the traditions and all that. And here's another sort of player. Um, let me see if I can share the sound then. That's beautiful music. And uh, this happens all the time at the temple and the fellow playing there, his father used to play when I was a child growing up there. So it's all, all, like an illustration of the hereditary, hereditary musician tradition out there. So here's another, here's a slide that I have from another temple, which is like two doors away from my grandmother's house. Again, this temple existed in the 1600s because on the 3rd of October, 1677, is when uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj visited that temple. So. What this tells me is two doors away from where I lived, or where my grandmother lived, was a historic monument. I didn't know that it was a historic monument till the year 1977, which is 300 years after this happened. When one day I just walked into the temple, I saw a group of people unveiling a portrait without too much fanfare of uh, a picture of uh, Shivaji Maharaja. And that's the first time this plaque was installed. And that's the first time I came to know as a 15 year old that this temple was a place which had been visited by Chhatrapati Shivaji. So it immediately connected the temple, which was the seat of Devi worship with Maratha history, with Mughal history, with the history of the uh, East India Company and uh, a whole lot of other festival traditions. So it, this is like a lot of information which was uh, uh, integral to a space that is just two doors away from home. Okay, um, so this is a scene from a festival in Mailapur in, in Chennai, which, which draws uh, lakhs of people, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, <clears throat> so having given this, all this introduction, mainly from the standpoint of Chennai, um, let me go on to the next slide. I'll give you a minute to digest it. So these are the areas that we will, that need, the temples need to be studied from. And uh, we will be covering a, a bit of all of this in this one quarter. And I'm just going to rush through as much of this as possible today. Um, not promising that we'll touch every aspect of these. But then, then when you talk about temples, uh, um, I use an empirical classification. There's many different architectural styles and many devatas that are enshrined in temples. And what are the essentials of a temple? And uh, we need to develop a book vocabulary, a sophisticated vocabulary to study temples and use the right terminology for the right things. Then there are Puranas that are associated with the temples. And these are, there's a special category of Puranas called the Sthala Puranas. Everybody knows what a Sthal is, right? A Sthal is a place. 
so the local purana the stories that are connected with it and how the puranas link across temples and all that then there's a huge amount of sculpt- sculptural wealth in temples you find amazing things like a stone locked in the mouth of in the mouth of an elephant you can see see it rolling but you cannot take it out um uh then you hear music you hear musical pillars and things like that then how is worship carried out in temples and how does it vary across india who are the priests in temples then we'll introduce a new word a word that is new to many people called the agamas with the shastras which govern temple worship in many temples um then the nitya puja what are the pujas offered on a daily basis and the utsavs the annual festivals and other festi- other festivals the personalities that have been historic personalities that have been involved in temples literature surrounding temples and then the music that is around that has evolved around temples and the history of how they were built and how they have evolved over time and very importantly we will cover what's called the bhakti movement which happened in the first millennium which shaped the history of temples to a large extent as we know today so um is this a good time to pause uh, um if there are any questions yeah perfect yeah. time actually we have just about 90 people on now we started with about 60 so you've already gone through a little bit of your background but um kanikshi this is amazing so you're going to be going over all of these details in the quarter long mm-hmm. course on hindu temples and traditions and yeah. right now in this webinar you're giving our 90 kind of attendees the overview and touching and and we're ans- asking questions and engaging so let me drop a link to the course in the chat right now so everyone can take a look and get a get a background on that the time that it's offered the dates every tuesday so that's that so now we can also take questions from the audience you can put it in the q and a box it's always easier to take it uh, if you put in the q and a box instead of the chat um and did you want to get into any other presentation or did you we have we have one question and it's kind of a general one which you probably can can go off of how do temples in the north of india differ from those in the south balaji was asking that yeah thank you balaji for the question it's uh uh, uh first of all visually visually they are very different okay the architecturally they are very different so i'll just give you relate an anecdote we we spent a long time in india in the year 98 um uh, we spent a good chunk of the year in india at that time we traveled quite a, quite a bit my daughter was like 3 years old and we used to take her around and uh, wherever as all three year three year olds are very curious so she used to ask what is this what is that and all that so we used to say uh this is a this is a kovil in tamil Yeah, well, when we traveled around to jaipur and other places we said okay this is that mandir and that's this mandir and all that then we come back to cincinnati and then we drive around we tell her um we do we are we are going to the kovil tonight um okay fine so she is excited all excited okay then we drive and then as we enter the cincinnati temple complex she looks at the tower from a distance and says appa this is not a kovil this is a mandir okay so that's the intuition of a three year old that immediately makes it apparent from the external sighting that architecturally the architectural style followed in northern indian temples is different from that in the south the worship tra- traditions are different um the depending on the agamic the agamas of the worship protocols that are being followed um so these are just two of the two of the differences and we'll get into more in the course as we um get into, get into there Yes, nice. That was interesting and a good story. Um <laughs> so do you want to keep your screen share going or yeah, we have I'll one more question going, but, just yeah. uh, asking what regions of India will be covered and maybe you're also going to look at temple like you're talking about all around the world maybe in some of the other connections or are we focusing just on specific regions of India? Um see it's very hard to draw a line here when you talk about hindu any hindu tradition for that matter because it's like it's so organic and we the diaspora have brought the traditions with us to many different parts of the world see i always draw a parallel when people moved from villages to cities they took the temple traditions with them to the cities and we the nris when we moved outside of india we brought those t- traditions here so there's a con- continuum of ideas so we will definitely talk about temples that are enshrined here from a general perspective um and we will try our best to cover all regions of india it's not just the south or the north or anything like that because i think they are all related so uh like in the next slide that i'm going to show you this is uh, adi shankara 
Would you call him a North Indian or would you call him a South Indian? There's no answer. He was born in the South, but he integrated and united in India in a manner that nobody else has done so far. I mean, his pilgrimage route of the 12 Jyotirlinga temples pretty much defines the sacred geography of India in a powerful way. I mean, he took priests from Kerala and had them start working in Badrinath. Okay. Then I think it was thanks to him that priests from Maharashtra work in uh, Rameshwaram. So this is, a, this is such a fine example of the vision that he had and um, integrated all these places um, um, together. So we will, we will cover as many regions as possible. Yeah, shall I go on? Uh, we got one more question. Will you be speaking about Devi, goddess, temples, and priestesses? Um, we will be talking about the Shakti Pitams and the tradition of Shakti worship very much as we will be talking about the five other traditions of uh, um, the Shaiva tradition, the Vaishnava tradition, the Shakti tradi tradition, the worship of Ganesha, the uh, worship of Kartikeya and the worship of uh, Surya. So these are the six um, um, uh, uh, forms of Devata worship that we will be talking about, which will cover everything else that um, comes under them. Nice. We can get into the details of the course maybe further into the presentation. Okay. Origins of temple worship. Um, it's generally uh, worship started in sacred groves, and you still see uh, remains of these sacred groves, like in places in Kerala. We refer use the word kavu or uh, uh, sole to refer to these uh, groves. So this was like a natural um, uh, habitat that we worship. And these are wayside deities under a tree. And, the, and what, happens is, what happened over a period of time is that these evolved into major edifices of worship, but the trees are still there. Like you see in this uh, huge temple in Tamil Nadu, you see a tree held in reverence and the devata being enshrined under the tree. Um, so uh, we can empirically classify temples as roadside, roadside shrines, guardian shrines, modern temples and ancient temples. Um, and again, like I said, it's very empirical. So these are some of the informal shrines that have survived the test of time um, under trees and on the wayside. And when you drive across the interstate, especially in Tamil Nadu, you see thousands, if not lakhs of temples on the trees that are dedicated to Ganesha. Similarly, if you go to Madhya Pradesh, you see a lot of temples of uh, Hanumanji uh, all over the place. Then you see temples of the goddess Bhagavati in so many different places in Kerala and pretty much all over India, actually. A stone on which vermilion is applied that becomes a sacred space of worship. Okay. Uh, these are guardian deities. These are deities that are enshrined around villages that are there to protect the villages. And these are modern temples. As you can see, these, are, these were built by Birla. Uh, the first one is in Delhi, and the second one, I'm not sure where it is. Um, these are also Birla Mandirs. One is in Hyderabad, and uh, the other, I'm not sure, the, sure of the place. The one in Hyderabad integrates the different styles of architecture. It's got a Dravidian architecture, uh, Gopuram in the front, and then behind you have the Orissa style of, Orissa style of the uh, Shikara and so on. This is a very ancient temple. This is where my um, grandfather lived and my father was born and all that. It's a place called Tiruvannamalai, which is where Ramana Maharishi lived. And this photo is taken from the top of a hill. And this is a huge temple complex. It's not just a temple, it's a complex. And there's a huge ecosystem that runs this place. Like, you know, there's hundreds of priests and hundreds of, the parivar is huge. And <laughs> the festival traditions are just, uh, uh, mega traditions, actually. They literally rock the state when it happens. You know, lakhs of people gather just on one full moon night in the month of Karthik and all that. And uh, this makes a fascinating study. There are books written, there are dissertations, there are books written about this place and uh, uh, all that. So this is the, in, when one, let's get into architecture a little bit. It's the South Indian temple. This is probably the best known specimen of South Indian architecture, the pyramidal structure. Um, this is a place called Tanjavur. Um, so um, 
we studied a lot about um, uh, the Mughals. We even studied about the Marathas. But uh, um, overall, the awareness of the Chola kings is just beginning to come to the front. Um, and actually, we are, we should all know a lot more about the contribution of the Chola kings, particularly to architecture and also the naval expeditions they led to the Far East and all that. So this is a temple that is built about 1,000 years ago. This is actually built and configurated. So this is not a pre-existing temple. It was built by a king called Raja Raja Sora. And he had, um, I mean, when you look at the inscriptions that describe what went on there, there's like a, a huge parivar of employees that were used, that, that were engaged in the service of the temple, the priests, the devadasis, the instrument players, the people that maintained the uh, gardens, the people that cooked, the, the people that did other forms of service to the temple. And uh, the list is just endless. And they are all documented using inscriptions on the walls of the temple and uh, other places. So this is one of those historically recorded and documented uh, temples. And this is just one um, example. Um, so in contrast, if you look at the, a temple from Northern India, this is called the Nagara style. So this is the Dravidian style and this is called the Nagara style. Um, so this is known more for the, 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 the shape of the shikara is different and the uh, position of the mandapas and other things are different. But regardless, you have all these, these are integral parts of um, Shastric temple architecture. You have a Garbha Griha where the deity is housed. Then you have the Ardha Mandapa, then the Mahamandapa, then the Parikrama path and the Shikar and all that. So it's like you progressively go deeper and deeper into yourself as you enter the temple and reach, reach the innermost recess, which is the Garbha Griha where the deity is uh, uh, housed. And the same similar structures are here in the North, Northern Indian style, as well as in the Orissa, Orissa style of temples. And this is the Lingaraj temple in Bhubaneswar. So you see the Shikara, you see the Garbhagriha, then uh, uh, this is the Mandapa in front and the other Mandapa is around, and then a path to circumambulate and all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, and it's not that this architecture happened overnight. They evolved over a period of time. This is an example of, an older style, which, which are all impermanent structures, like this is in Kerala. And any, re, any guesses on why the roof, roof is a slanting one as opposed to the flat roofs elsewhere? So Kerala gets uh, rain throughout the year. Okay, so the architecture in Kerala, is, it's pretty much similar to this. So even the modern temples in Kerala are built like this, as are the temples in Nepal. So this is an example of a rock cut temple. They actually got into the rocks and built these temples. And this is one of the finest examples of sculpture on a rock, a bas relief. Um, it's called Arjuna's Penance. And uh, uh, this is again a rock cut temple. This is probably from the Elora area. And uh, this is again the famous Kailashnath temple um, in Maharashtra, Maharashtra, which is carved out of a hill. And this is one that inspired the construction of this Kailashnath temple in Kanchipuram. Um, and so, so this is uh, all the early stuff, early forms of architecture um, <coughs> evolved into what came into being in the 11th century, almost like a, a precursor to a lot of other things. And this is the famous temple in Tanjavur, which I just shared with you just a couple of minutes back. This is the Raja Raja uh, Chora built temple. Um, should we stop here for just a second? Any questions? Um, Deepa is asking, and this is kind of a general question, right? And you got into it, the spiritual mm -hmm. aspects behind temple tradition mm -hmm. and how it's different from say a church or a mosque. That sounds like a pretty broad question that you're going to dig into. I don't know if you want to take that now. Um, I, I think we briefly touched upon it, um, but we'll We'll deal with it in detail in the course. Um, and if we have time, we'll try to get back into it in the end, so. Yeah. Uh, and actually it will get covered as we as I move with the rest of the slides, so. Um. <clears throat> uh, Suresh is asking uh, about information on how these temples were constructed a thousand years ago and the type of technology that might've been used for foundations, structural integrity, heavy lifting, the tons of stone, sculpting, et cetera and similarities with the Mayan pyramids and the columned arcades of Chichen Itza? 
Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, they used uh, Apple computers and uh, <laughs> modeling software and all that kind of stuff. No, just kidding. Um, so it's like, it, it boggles the mind as to how these might have, might have done. There are theories and uh, let me just uh, expand upon that. If you look at this picture, the, the height of this tower here is uh, 216 feet. Okay, 216 feet. So that is approximately what? 25 stories. Um, and all this is built of sandstone, which is heavy rock basically. And the sandstone was not mined in the immediate vicinity. It was mined elsewhere and actually brought here. And there is no, there's no cement that binds these pieces together. So guess how the pieces are held? They are held by the force of gravity thanks to interlocking pieces of uh, uh, literally pre-built material. So imagine the kind of precision that has gone into it. And um, this, there's a story that the piece on top, uh, uh, just below the Kalash, the Kalash itself is huge. So when I say Kalash, it's a metal um, uh, attachment on top of the temple, uh, on top of the Shikara, which uh, again has a lot of sig significance. They talk about the conducting, it, um, the tower itself being a uh, means to conduct lightning and protecting the neighborhood and all the kind of stuff. Um, and also a means of storing seeds. And I mean, there's, there's so many things associated with uh, the construction of a temple, but the thing of interest here and relevance to the question is this large piece of uh, um, material on top of, the, on top of the shikar, how was it brought and assembled there? So one model says that um, they built a ramp with dirt, which is about two miles long. Okay, and they used the bullocks and the other animal animals to haul this uh, piece of sculpted work all the way to the top. And then once it was interlocked there, gravity took care of everything else. Okay, it's, isn't it mind boggling? Um, you can uh, two once mile you, ramp. Yeah, yeah. And uh, once you um, go, so I mean, that is a legend that is associated with it. I'm not sure of the um, exact details of how this was done because we don't have those records as to how they um, did them. Um, and then again, once you go into the Garba Griha, you can actually see the hollow of the tower that is inside there. And there are some inner chambers where there are murals as well. So um, this is relatively newer. So the tower that you see here is called the Raja Gopuram. It's a Gopuram at the entrance. So the shape of this is different from what we call the Vim, uh, sorry, from the Vimana, which is at the center of the uh, temple itself. So, um, so these are modern structures, which were probably, which were definitely built during the time of the Vijayanagar kings. And again, the study of Vijayanagar itself should be at least a semester long course because their contributions to Indian history and culture and temples is just phenomenal. It's just, uh, um, you, 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 don't, you don't even know where to start. Um, but again, to answer the question regarding the spiritual um, heritage here. So a temple is not complete without the following. You have a murti. So um, in the Hindu tradition, we acknowledge the formless, the nishkala rupa, which is uh, uh, the we acknowledge the uh, the, the uh, unmanifest reality which manifests itself in every form of what we know as creation. We acknowledge that it's it's purnatva, it is infinite. But then, how did you connect to the infinite? You connect to the infinite through an ishta devata, which you conceive in the form of the finite. So that is where the murti um, upasana comes in or the archa upasana comes in. So the murti is the form of representation of the divine. Okay, so the murti can be an, uh, a formless form of the lingam as you see in Shiva worship, or it can be worshiped with a form that you can, with a, you know, hum, in the, with a form that you can relate to like Devi, for example, or Ganesha, for example, or Mahavishnu, for example, Krishna, Rama and all that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> the murti is enshrined in the main sanctum in a temple, like, inside this chamber in the form of a shivalingam, but then you also have the murti enshrined in the form of uh, the processional image, which we refer to as a utsava murti. 
Utsav is a festival and the murti that's associated with an Utsav is the Utsav murti, who's taken out in processions. So even in our own Cincinnati temple, we have the um, deities and shrine, but then we have the bronze images which are taken out in procession, right? Then we have the Tirtha. Tirtha is water. So there's a water body that's associated with temples. It can either be a river, it could be an ocean, or it could be a tank that is dug, which satisfies and takes care of the irrigation needs of, and the drinking water needs in the area. So it's like temples used to be places where, which would offer hospitality. In those days, you travel for two kilometers, it'll probably take you half a day. You go from one temple to another, there's a place to bathe and there's a place to stay. There are various mandapams inside the temples. You have what's called the Alankara mandapam, you have the Kalyana mandapam, you have the Namaskara mandapam in Kerala, you have the Kutambalam, you have mandapams for performing, for the performing arts, and you have uh, the thousand pillar halls where even uh, panchayats used to be held and disputes used to be resolved. And there used to be protection for provision for people to just come and stay in the case of a calamity or a flood or anything like that. Then you have what's called the Vriksham, the Vriksh. People know the Vrikshasana, the tree asana, right? So Vriksha is a tree. So every temple is associated with a sacred grove. That's how these, that's how temple worship started. Um, so, so here is uh, a, a Vriksha called the Nagalinga tree. Many of you would not have seen this. And this was just Vriksha in the tree that was in the temple that was just across uh, the street from my house where I grew up. So look at the flower. Um, it's very, very, very fragrant. And you see those uh, flesh covered colored leaves and you see the inner uh, space where the, uh, the, this is almost like the hood of a snake. Okay, and deep in here in the socket, it's like the, you can imagine a shivalingam here. And this is the bed for the shivalingam. So it's like the Naga and the Linga. So this is called a Naga Linga tree. And we, it's possible that the entire region may have been a grove of Nagalinga trees. But during my time, we only had two trees and one of them was cut down. That was the, one of the saddest days in my life when I saw them actually cutting it down. Why did they cut down? Because the temple was, uh, needed money. So once they cut the tree down, it was possible for them to build a shed in that space and rent it out and then actually make money to uh, carry out some of the temple functions or something like that. So, see, um, I used this opportunity to insert this message that, hey, things need to be done to protect the heritage of our temples, otherwise you'll be losing things one by one. Um, so, the other thing was the Parivara Devatas. Apart from the Murti, there are other Devatas. So, when you go to a temple, it's Shiva temple, it's not just Shiva. You have Parvati, no, well, Parvati and Shiva, the main deities, and you have uh, uh, other forms of Shiva, like Dakshinamurti, Nataraja, and all that. Then you have uh, Nandi, you have uh, uh, Brahma, Durga, and uh, other Goshta Devatas, and so on. There's so much that uh, needs to be covered in this. And then the Stala Puranas. Every temple is associated with a, a Purana or a legend. Um, so the Stala Purana is like this. If you imagine the universal state of existence and the timeless state of existence, then you localize the temple with time and space coordinates. So you bring in the geographical connection, the historical connection and the local connection. And then there are traditions that are associated with the Vedas that are, uh, um, and then there are traditions that are associated with the Itihasas. Like for instance, there are many temples in India which are associated with the, with the Pandavas. Can anybody quickly type in, a, type in an example of a temple that has historic association with the Pandavas? Anyone? Mahabalipuram, Kadri. Yeah, Mahabalipuram, it's uh, actu actually commemorating the Pandavas. And there are five ratas there that are supposed to represent each of the Pandavas. Good answer. Uh, Kedarnath. Kedar, um, so the, it's so the, we have the fascinating um, final chapters in the Mahabharata where the Pandavas actually walk through the Himalayas, and um, Yudhishthira is the last one to survive along with a dog, right? And uh, so there is an association between the uh, Pandavas and the Mah and the uh, uh, Himalayas, and Kedarnath is the place where uh, Arjuna worshipped Shiva. Okay, and um, Similarly, there are other places. Uh, um, uh, okay, another association between the Itihasas and uh, temples. There's a place in Kerala where there's a temple to Sita, Sita alone. You don't have Ram there. 
you just have sita lava and kusha and uh, there's also an image of valmiki and the story is that this place is associated with the Ut- uttarakhand of the uttarakhandam of the ramayana and uh, the the place has uh, termite problems see the w- name valmiki actually refers to termites okay um it's all the ant hill actually the name valmiki ref- um uh refers to an ant hill so that place has the problem with ant hills and termites and stuff like that <coughs> and sita devi is worshiped there so sim- similarly um uh there are other places that are associated with the eight many many of the 18 puranas like somnath for example is uh, uh in gujarat is associated with a uh, st- story of the moon god which is um, uh, chandra offering worship there then um, you have chidambaram where the munis patanjali and vyagrapada offered worship um, so these are all uh, puranic uh, uh, lore then we have historic lore um, and many of those are connected with saints uh, i don't want to use the word saints many of those are connected with uh, yogis that have lived and breathed in india that have visited those temples and have, uh, there are some miracles associated, associated with them and again what is a miracle a miracle is something that we believe um is beyond our understand it's beyond our perception of what how we think t- things should be right so anything could be a miracle to me life itself is a miracle but then there are things that are regarded over a period of time like uh, there's this fascinating story in south india in a place called uh, tirukadavur where uh, there was a yogi by name abhirama butter he was so involved in the worship of devi that the when when a king came and asked him what the tithi that day was he didn't even hesitate and he said it was a purnima when actually it was an amavasya and that was it so uh, he was in danger of losing his life because if he said anything wrong the king could actually put him to death the story goes that that night devi abhirami which is uh, parvati devi actually threw her jewelry into the sky so that it shone like the moon okay so there are uh, traditions like this associated uh, with many different temples so these are the stala puranas um there is a place called achalgad in mount abu um where there is a tradition tradition that there is a river that flows nearby and it's believed that uh, that river was a river of ghee and similarly there is a place called achaleshwar mahadev achalesh achaleshwaram in south india where there is a tradition that um there was a yogi that just got a bowl of water from the temple tank and lit a lamp with it um again corroborating with a vision that the water was nothing other than ghee to light a lamp okay so um so so a temple is a combination of uh uh, uh traditions okay um uh uh i don't want to use the word legend these are puranas these are local traditions of the stala puranas um and the temp the temple has to have a murti which is enshrined and worshiped using a certain protocol um a temple is a place of festivals a temple is a place of uh, um social con- congregation as well but these are not organized congregations as in other other uh, <laughs> uh, faiths and um um again there's a lot of history and uh, um a display of arts as in architecture and sculpture and so on and so forth so there's a lot more that meets the eye when it comes to the temple that was great you know going into the elements of the temple and then the details of a specific one um oh you're going to go into this next one we no, have no i i can pause here if you have yeah any. yeah i think now is a great time to take some of the questions on the course right bini g is asking details on the course again it starts in october it goes until december i've dropped the times but also what kind of assignments will there be tests and examinations those kinds of questions and um you know again we're using the hua learning management system so you log in and connect has uploaded week by week what you're going to be focusing on if there's and he'll maybe explain some of the materials that he's going to be sharing the zoom link all of that platform that you would expect we have it and that's going to be built in um so connect you if you want to talk about some of those details about the the course the layout the structure the assignments yeah. 
Yeah, then absolutely. Then. So we'll be meeting once a week and the, the instruction will be in a lecture discussion format and there will be some reading assignments uh, for sure. And I will uh, send you selected links for reading and some PDF files and all that. There's no prescribed textbook as such. Uh, because the material is so diverse that there's no one textbook that compiles all this um, information. Um, the, there will be one exam in the end, which is again objective, and it's more like matching answers and uh, uh, picking a correct answer from a uh, selection of answers. Um, and we could optionally have a paper or a presentation where you pick a temple of your choice and just give a very short uh, presentation on aspects. Um, like, you know, bringing that temple in the, into the framework of how we are going to be discussing temples in the class. So, so we all are familiar with our um, local temples, our, um, the villages that our ancestors hail from. Uh, and we're going to be learning a whole bunch of uh, vocabulary and a framework to look at temples in this course. So what would it take for you to bring you, the temple of your choice into that framework and present it in class just in five minutes or uh, something like that? So there'll be assignments like that. And the course is designed to make you learn it's designed to make you uh, pass and do well and actually leave you with a thirst for knowing more. It is not designed to be punitive in any way, shape or form. So we want more people to know about our heritage and also maybe even take steps to start preserving some of it. And so I think this is just a beginning. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. And there are no prerequisites for the course. Like we're, it's an open, you can just engage directly. We always encourage people to take the orientation to Hindu studies course. That's uh, one of our flagship courses at HUA, but this course is standalone. You can just join it. And as Kanikshi said, it's going to be for your enlightenment and application of this knowledge, not a, you know, to get a grade. You're taking this because you're interested in it, hopefully. So let me uh, share a quick poll. Are you interested in enrolling in the Hindu temples and traditions course? Please just let us know. Yes, no. Maybe I have a question. Um, that way we can follow up a little bit specifically we do have some more questions um kind of just general did you want to get into the rest of the oh actually we also have a hundred dollar discount that uh, will expire at the end of tuesday night so if you enroll today tomorrow uh it's only going to be two hundred dollars so regular price is three hundred dollars so if that helps you off the fence and enroll that is great if you already enrolled you know put it in the chat get uh get uh get some of that encouragement going we'd love to see people sign up right here because it uh it just gets the momentum going and connects g we're uh we're looking for like 20 25 students probably and it'd be awesome to have different people do presentations on different local mandirs and connect it to this framework that is mm -hmm. a that, oh man that's suresh g just signed up thank you suresh g great great wonderful wonderful um and People should participate. The whole thing is about participation, class involvement, because it's not, uh, this course is not just going to be about me talking all the time or anything like that. There'll be a lot of visuals, a lot of um, videos to watch and uh, people um, sharing things back and forth. And it's like, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I will learn from you guys as well. So it's not, uh, it, it will not be a one-way street, but then what, <laughs> what it'll give you is it'll give you a framework to analyze the whole course. And it will also give you no, it'll give you a framework to study the temples of India and it'll also give you a powerful vocabulary that'll help help us appreciate the culture a lot more. And hopefully it'll create a thirst in all of us to go visit some temples in India that we have not seen before. And uh, my request to all of you is please do spread the word among your friends and who might be interested in joining and uh, um, we'll, have, we'll have fun with this uh, course, that's for sure. Nice. So we'll, we'll, in the follow-up email that uh, everyone, you know, you registered in the follow-up email that we'll send, we'll include the recording of this webinar. And if Knicks G has some specific points he wants to include, but we usually don't uh, just share all the slides, you know, it just gets out there. But if Knicks G has some links, we'll include, and again, the recording of this webinar. Um, that'll go out to everyone as a follow-up to this. We have a few more questions, but uh, did you want to continue with the presentation? We still have 80 people on with us, uh, hanging on to your, your presentation and, and curious and got a nice. couple more questions coming in as well. Yeah, definitely. I can go on. So how many minutes do we have left? Uh, it's up to you, Konixji. Usually, you know, top of the hour is nice, but then we can also extend to the next half hour if a lot more questions come in and 
There's no no hard stop. No hard stop. Right okay. Now. So let me go on till the top of the hour and then we'll pause again for questions and there's interest with interest with go for this. Okay. Uh, can you see this slide? Um, so, yeah. so the uh, murtis that we talked about, the forms of worship. So there's many different forms. They, the, the Supreme is worshipped in the form of uh, Ganesha, Skanda, Shiva, Shakti, Vishnu, and Surya, and many, many, and many more uh, deities also. Um, so when it comes to Ganesha, this is an example of the Ashta Vinayak in uh, Maharashtra, the eight Vinayak temples in and around uh, Pune. This is uh, a temple dedicated to Ganesha in uh, South India in a place called Trichy, which is associated with the Ramayana. Actually, the story goes that uh, Vibhishana, um, Ganesha played a trick on Vibhish Vibhishan when he was headed to Sri Lanka carrying an image of Mahavishnu and then caused the image to get stuck to the ground. So Vibhishana came, came running after, after Ganesha and Ganesha ran and ran and ran till he reached the top of the hill and where he just turned into a sculpted image of Ganesha. So that's one of the, uh, that's the legend that's associated with this uh, place. This, we, this is uh, Vital in uh, Maharashtra. Um, this is, a, this is the image of Mahavishnu, which is carried by Vibhishana and enshrined in uh, uh, on the banks of the river Kaveri in Tamil Nadu. And this is apparently an image of Mahavishnu, which was held in worship by uh, Sri Ram in Ayodhya. And that's the image that he parted with when he let Vibhishana go back to Sri Lanka after the Patavishekam. So this is probably India's largest temple ever. This is in a place called Sri Rangam. This is where that, that image of Mahavishnu is enshrined. And look at the connection. This is not in isolation. This, <laughs> this is intimately connected with the Ramayana. You have Ram, you have a, a Vibhishana, you have the image that was held in worship by him. And you have this, look at the layer of towers. The Vimana is inside, that's the smallest. Then you have a tower that's slightly bigger than one that's bigger, then one that's bigger, then bigger. And finally, you don't even see the largest one in, in this picture. That's, uh, that's the tallest temple tower in Tamil Nadu. In, in uh, probably in India. This is, of course, Ram Setu. And uh, this is Rameshwaram, which is uh, at, literally at the tip of Ram Setu, where uh, Ram worshipped Shiva on the way back from Sri Lanka. And there's a tradition of bhaktas, so or the yogis, um, which again, we'll get into in detail in the course. Um, the, then about Shiva, the amount of Stala Puranas is just huge. Um, this is uh, from Elephant Caves, where we, um, where the five face Shiva is portrayed. Um, you see only the three faces in front, but there are faces which are hidden behind. Um, the names of the five faces are Sadyo, Jata, Vamadeva, Agora, Tatpurusha, Ishana. Um, and uh, this is a place, the Stala Purana of the dance of Shiva is portrayed here beautifully. There are five different temples in Tamil Nadu, which enshrine Shiva as the cosmic dancer. Okay. And, uh, oh, sorry. What happened? Maybe exited your presentation. Oh. Maybe you need to reopen yeah. it. Yeah. Is it back? Yep. Okay. okay. You see five images of Nataraja, the dancing Shiva here. So the one in the center, um, as you can see, is very different from the Nataraja that you normally know. So the two to the right, they just look like Nataraja that you know in, in any other place, right? Um, Shiva dancing with his left foot, foot raised, and then Parvati in the form of Shiva Kami standing right next to him. But in the one in the center, he has his leg raised all the way up. It's called the Urdhva Tandava. Um, that is related to uh, the story of a dance competition between Shiva and Kali. Then right next to it, you see the image of uh, Nadraja with the leg flipped. So he's dancing with the right foot raised and not the left foot raised. Um, and this is in a place called Madurai, Madurai which is associated with the story of a local king 
who prayed to Shiva requesting him to switch feet because he was concerned that it would hurt him dancing like that. Again, the whole idea of the dance of Shiva is, uh, it is, uh, it's a representation of the cosmos itself. This is just an image that is frozen in time. So you see the hair of, matted hair of Shiva flying. So it's like a uh, snapshot of, a, of uh, something in motion. So Shiva is just twirling round and round and round. And it, at one particular point, the image is snapped and that is how you get the literally like a, uh, a frozen in time representation of uh, uh, the dance of Shiva. Um, so this is a story of Markandeya, which is portrayed in a um, temple in South India, which is associated with a celebration of 60th and 80th birthday. So the longevity is celebrated in this temple. Um, this is Chidambaram with the golden roof. The five elements of wind, water, fire, earth, and space are uh, uh, celebrated as um, manifestations of Shiva. Um, and this is the one of the most important things that people cover in the course. This is the sacred geography of India as envisaged by Adi Shankara. So in here, you see the 12 Jyotir Lingas of Shiva. Um, covering Kedarnath in the Himalayas, um, Kashi, there is Banaras, Dameshwaram in the deep south, Sri Sailam in Andhra Pradesh, Ujjain, and uh, um, other, yeah, there's one more um, in uh, central India, then you have a few of them in Maharashtra, then Somnath in Gujarat, then Vaidyanath uh, in uh, uh, Bihar, and uh, uh, depending on what the tradition says. And so this is um, going to be an important aspect of what we cover in the course, the Jyotir Lingas of Shiva. This is Kedarnath, of course, the Somnath. This is um, Triambakeshwar in Maharashtra. No, this is Bhima Shankar in Maharashtra. This is Banaras, one of the Jyotir Lingas. Okay, this is a golden spire of the Kashi Vishwanath temple. The whole area is being renovated now. It used to be that you had to walk through a multitude of gullies to reach this place, but now they're building a huge pathway from the Ganges, from the Ganga to the temple and a huge wall around the temple and all that. It's, it's just going to be grand once the whole thing comes into place. Uh, so this is uh, the, the Shakti Peters, which also we'll be covering in this course. There are several Shakti Peters in uh, all over India which are associated with the legend of uh, different parts of the body of Sati falling in different places when Shiva performed the Ghora Tandava when Sati was killed. Uh, so this is Kamakya and Assam. This is uh, uh, what's called the Sri Chakra used in worship. And this is a Shakti temple near um, where I was raised in North Madras. And this is the image of Shivaji that I talked about that, is, that was revealed in 1977. Surya, this is Konarak. Um, we will cover the Bhakti movement in detail in the course. And uh, this just something else I wanted to mention before I close the presentation. Um, we'll cover the um, cultural wealth as well and place emphasis on the fact that temples foster the arts and bring communities together. And uh, there's a lot of connection between temples and music, and what is played in temples and what should be played, what should not be played. And the, here's an image, example of a processional image. These are all priceless bronzes, which were, which were made more than a thousand years ago. Just imagine walking into a temple and you're in front of uh, a priceless work of art. Um, if you look at it as art, which has been in worship for more than a thousand years. Uh, this is Nataraja, the classic image. Okay? Then this is the uh, Ram Parivar. Um, again, this is all, all this is from the Madras bronze collection in the Madras Museum. And uh, this is Puri Jagannath, of course. And how the festival images are taken in procession throughout villages and cities to facilitate the darshan of people who might otherwise not be able to make it to the temple because of the age or illness or something like that. 
So this, these are images of processions in Tirupati. Uh, again, this is uh, the Ratyatra is not unique to Puri alone. This is a place in Tamil Nadu where uh, this happens in the month of uh, March, typically March, April, typically in the month of Chaitra, um, actually Falcon, um, where thousands of people draw the chariot around the village. And this is um, again, another festival. Um, I wanted to mention Agama Shastras. Agama Shastras is a huge body of work, just like the Vedas, which are used in uh, <coughs> temple worship, which related, which relate to worshiping murtis and temples. They deal with the Shilpa Shastra as to how the deities are to be made. They deal with uh, e even the proportion of uh, this, the various parts of the body when the images are made and how the temples are to be built, uh, what kind of a land is to be chosen and uh, the, the, the dimensions and uh, the kind of pillars, the kind of uh, every single detail is covered in the Agama Shastra. So it's just blows your mind away to think of the fact that these were written more than a, a thousand years ago. They're all in Sanskrit, of course. And there is a, um, many different Agama Shastras in Shiva temples, they are Primarily, uh, one of the best known Agamas is the Uttara Kamika Agama. Then you have the Vaishnava Agamas for the Vishnu temples. And in Kerala, the worship is uh, primarily through the Tantra uh, tradition. And the Agama Shastras describe how, who is eligible, um, who is qualified at what point in time, after what education to actually carry out pujas within a within temple. Um, and uh, remember when I was talking about the Tanjavu temple, I talked about the huge parivar of temple employees that were needed to do all kinds of work. Uh, the Shastras, talk, the Agama Shastras actually talk about that. And they are followed in practice. I mean, this is not an archaic piece of work. They're very much used in worship in uh, most of the big temples that we know about. And we learn um, some about the Agama Shastras as well. Uh, for those who are, who are into yoga and have read the yoga sutras, you will find the word agama to be familiar when you, in the context of the uh, pramana, um, uh, which is in the first pada itself. Um, but more about that later as we go. But it's not a reference to these agamas, but it's a generic noun of agama that is uh, referred to there. Um, so, I will definitely address this question in the course. How can we, the Indian diaspora, leave a lasting legacy for the upcoming generations through the network of temples that we have created in North America? So, yeah, this is exactly what the immigrants from villages did in big cities. So, just take 30 seconds to read this. The temples have been centers of knowledge. To me, that's the most important thing. Sala Puranas are a means of creating local geographic connection with the universal. The Sala Vrikshas can reinforce an ancient tradition. So there's much we can do here. And uh, 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 we'll, we will not have time in the, in the course to get into the uh, allied, um, uh, into Sikh temples or Jain temples, but I wanted to use, include them in this presentation for the sake of uh, uh, completion. This is Mount Abu in uh, Rajasthan. And finally, we go back to the slide. That's what we are going to be covering in this course. So that's a lot of material. Uh, we'll do as much, whatever is possible to do justice to this. And, and if there's enough interest, we can always go for part two and so on and so forth. So I'm happy to answer any more questions that you may have, but. Uh... Yeah, we still have a few more questions. And I have a question for you. We have only 44 out of 67 people who filled out the, uh, question on if you're interested in enrolling. So if you haven't filled it out, please let us know. Yes, no, maybe we have almost 20, 25 people who are interested or saying yes. So that's going to be good. Sureshji, one of our already enrollees has a question about yeah. the top down construction mm -hmm. of the Kailasa temple. Is there any evidence for that? And second question he has, will you be covering Angkor Wat and other famous temples in Cambodia, Bali, Myanmar? We will touch upon those, the Angkor Wat and yes. And the, yeah. The top-down story is very interesting. The, uh, there's a story on Elora, Elora itself in Amar Chitrakata, which talks about the queen, a queen who wanted to have a darshan of the temple before she died. That she, she stopped eating and said that she would not eat anything till the 
till she saw the temple constructed. So the story goes that the minister was, who was very smart said, okay, the only way to convince the queen is to show her the top of the temple. So apparently he had uh, just, the, he carved into a hill and just had the top of it excavated and carved into the form of the shikara of the, the top of the shikara of the temple. And once the queen saw that, she broke her fast with the impression that the temple is completed. Uh, whereas the temple is not actually completed at that point in time. So that is a story around it. I'm not sure of the exact historical details of how it is, was uh, uh, constructed. But again, think of it if you've been to Elora, it is a massive edifice, okay? And it's in the middle of a, a hill, so to say. So it, it definitely would have been carved top down because they did not assemble things there at all. Nothing there is assembled. Everything is cut from a single piece of rock. Um, so these are wonders of the world, but they're not known as wonders of the world, basically. So. And uh, great. And then uh, Shito Shah has kind of two questions. You went into it already. Amurthy is more than an idol. It has a whole history and meaning and, and comes with that. Yeah. But then differentiating Murthy from idol, and then we are, will the course touch on temple or mandir economics? Uh, I don't know if we'll have time for that, but I think we should, at least to some extent. Um, uh, so there's, there's a lot of uh, political movements happening in India as to who's controlling what temple and uh, all that kind of stuff. I don't want to get into politics per se, but it would definitely help us uh, to gain an understanding of what... I mean, just look at this. Um, just take one area, for example, supply chain. Supply chain is a big thing that we talk about in day-to-day -day life. Think of the supply chains for a temple. What is involved? Where do things come from? What are the activities that are needed to keep temple activities in place? My mother asked me a question. She said, is it true that tulips are imported from Holland for worship in Tirupati? Um, I asked her where, it, where she heard about it from, and she said, what's that? So everybody's a student of WhatsApp University these days, but I think there might be some truth in it because I think the Tirupati temple does get its fresh supply of flowers from many different parts of the land and they're de delivered by many different means. So there is obviously a huge process in place. Going back a thousand years, there was a process in place. That process has evolved over time. And for any of these processes to work, these processes to work, there has to be uh, enough material resources. And where did the resources come from? And that's where the economics of temples come into play. Yes, we will touch upon it. Great, yes. Tiffany's asking what day and time is the class? It is on Tuesday, every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern time until 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. I did see people talking about it's not convenient for me in Australia or Europe or India or in different places. And if you have kids on the West Coast, we know but we're looking to be a global university and times don't always work for everyone. Um, this is what we've settled on on this course in this quarter, but in the future, we will make the effort to make more courses more accessible to different parts of the world. So this, this one, Hindu Temples and Traditions with Dr. Kanikshi is gonna be on Tuesday, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, starting October 12th, going to December 21st. If you click the link, you can see the couple holidays that we're gonna have and days off and all that's in there. And the classes will be recorded. So if you miss a week, you can have easy access to it through the learning management system and, and watch it. But of course, it's not the same as interacting live. Even if it is on Zoom, you still get that opportunity. And we're in webinar mode right now. So you're not getting to see you know, the, the different people asking their questions. And I'm kind of relaying that in the course, you will have that opportunity to see each other and communicate. And I think Kanikshi wants that to be the, the mode of uh, the course. I'm Totally, yes. All right. Anything you want to add to that? Uh, I think that's it. I look forward to uh, um, sharing this. Yeah, so please do share it with your friends. And then the more interactive it is, the more fun the course is, the more we will all get out. Yeah. Udeji was just asking, is, what's the format of teaching? It's interactive. There'll be live presentations. Yes, Kanikshi is going to do all of this. Yeah. So you can look forward to it. Be sure to enroll. Um, uh, we're kind of closing in. There aren't too many more questions left. Uh, one, are you going to get into symbolism? All sorts of different symbolism of snakes and statues and the, the significance of 
geography? Is that something that you're going to pick up in depth or like one course or how are you going to address all of that? It's definitely going to be part of the course. Yeah. All right, Kumbuji, your question, I asked it for you. There you go. <laughs> um, and oh, so <laughs> Shito's asking, are you going to offer a music class in the future again? Yeah. If we get enrollment, if we get enrollment, yes. You know, Definitely. that's one of those yeah. things. We have to have interest. And I, Kanikshi, if you wanted to speak to that, because you taught uh, the course before. How did it go? If you want to just give some feedback on that, and yeah. then we can transition into closing. Yeah, this absolutely. Webinar. So we offer a three-quarter sequence on Indian um, classical music. So it basically covers the music of Bharat um, all the time, all the way from the ancient times which featuring the Nadia Shastra of Bharata Muni, as well as uh, some old Tamil works and also the chants of the Sama Vedas and Veda and so on and so forth. All the way from there to what the state of music is right now, covering aspects of music theory, history, practice, analysis, and so on and so forth. Now, um, I've, I think the course could be condensed into a two quarter sequence rather than a three quarter sequence. Um, we had a group of uh, fantastic, fantastic group of students that uh, were with us for all three quarters. And uh, the amount of interaction we had, it al almost used to feel like we didn't want the class to end. So every Tuesday, it would just go on uh, till one of us decided, okay, <laughs> we are leaving. It, it, was, it was almost like that. And the last class always, the final class of the semester always left us with a feeling of uh, pain. Oh, when are we going to see each other again? Kind of a thing. So that's the kind of uh, um, conversations that we had during the course. And um, uh, I, from, from the feedback I got, uh, people really enjoyed it and got a lot, a lot out of this, out of this course. Um, going forward, I think I'd like to cut it down into two, two quarters, but we would um, again, it is one of those courses that benefits a lot from interaction. Um, so we would need a good amount of enrollment for this to work. Um, and we will probably do a webinar to announce that class and um, spread the word around even more. So we are continuing to grow and offer courses according to your interests and we're growing and building. We had a wonderful graduation ceremony with our Sanskrit students yesterday. We're offering new courses with Dr. Knix this quarter. This is the first time this course is being offered and it's something that people have wanted, right? What about the temples and the traditions, right? How are we going to get into it? And we're glad to be offering this course with Dr. Knix in this next quarter and hope you will uh, enroll and attend and participate and continue to grow and build with us at Hindu University of America in this uh, in this endeavor and project that we're on. Awesome. Uh, yeah, Kanikshi, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining and participating. Uh, this was a fun one. Um, closing thoughts, Kanikshi. Uh, I look forward to um, meeting people again and uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation. Please do feel free to get in touch with me. Please do visit the website templenet.com and do not hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions. It's kanikes at gmail.com. K-A-N-N-I-K-S at gmail.com. So like I said, uh, the, the website templenet has been around for several several years right now. And uh, um, I feel that this information should be known to people. It should be shared widely. Um, people should be more familiar with the temple vocabulary and should be able to relate to temples in a more powerful way. And that's pretty much the goal of the course. And I hope uh, we will be able to share it with a wide range of people. And I really, really look forward to it. Danya, namaste. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you all.